us remain standing as we call on the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we, who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection, may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us now also affirm our faith together as one church body. With the Apostles' Creed, we use confessions such as this to remind us and to teach us that we are a part of a church that is ancient as well as universal. Together as one body, let us affirm our faith now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall endless prayer. 
Please be seated. Let us now draw near to the Lord and confess our need for his grace to change us and to renew us. The psalmist writes, let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exalt and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. Even so, we have forgotten that great freedom and have instead submitted again to the yoke of slavery, falling into the snare of sin, trying to climb out by our own futile effort. O oh God, who for our redemption submitted your precious Son unto death on the cross, forgive us. By his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of sin. Grant us so to date to ourselves that we may evermore live with him in the joy and freedom of his resurrection through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. O oh, Father, we do confess to you the greatness of our sin and how far we have fallen short. And yet, Father, we thank you for, the, that for your greater love, that you are the one who has come to redeem us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life and his death and his resurrection. Thank you for the, the, the finished salvation that has come to us through him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let us now stand together as we hear these words of assurance. This is how God has showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thanks be to God. Glory in my Redeemer. 
song I'll never see. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when he calls me, it will be paradise, his face forever to behold. His face forever. Brothers and sisters, on this Resurrection Sunday, the Word of God is indeed living and active. May the eyes of our hearts be opened as I read from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5 and 9 to 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please, won't you pray with me? Most high God, how great and unsearchable are your ways. How perfect is your law. You created us, and even as we, your creatures, have sinned against you, you have provided a perfect sacrifice in our place. Humble us with this realization that we deserve death and punishment. Yet you have chosen us in our sin and misery and have saved us to be with you. Renew our sense of wonder and awe as we remember the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus. We remember his death and resurrection every week and even every day. But today we have set aside as a special celebration of that glorious resurrection. We have hope of our own resurrection from the dead because of that wonderful miracle by Jesus. Fill us with the joy that surpasses all understanding the joy that is greater than our present circumstances, that we might live for you. Grant us, your people, a desire to share this joy with those you have put in our path. Fill us, Lord, and send us out. Father, build up this body of Christ. Unite us by the power of your Spirit, that even in a time of change we will stand firm. May each person that you have brought here by your providence be a part of this family, united for a singular purpose, to glorify you and enjoy you forever. Let there be restoration of broken relationships. Let there be grace where there is none. Let there be a spirit of harmony as we shine as a city on a hill for this darkening culture. We continue to lift up to you the pastoral search committee Bless their efforts while preparing and sending the next pastor for this body of Christ. We lift up to you, Lord, your larger church as well. 
Bless congregations in our community, like Macedonia Baptist Church, as they worship you in spirit and in truth on this special holiday, but as they also live out their calling in your kingdom. We ask that you work in and through the missionaries and their ministries whom we support. Specifically, we lift up to you the Pregnancy Help Center of Williamson County and the prison ministry, both of which minister to some of the most vulnerable members of our society. Bless all of us with a desire to protect and to minister to those who are most vulnerable and in need. You, Lord, have given us a command to pray without ceasing. Grant us a desire and an ability to live out all that you have commanded, including this. Even now, teach us to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service, we'll be passing the peace of Christ to one another. If there is someone here who you don't know, please seek them out and greet them, as we were all new here once. While your children are certainly welcome and encouraged to worship with us, at this time they can also be dismissed for some age-appropriate worship, ages 3 to 5. And again, if you would, please remember to sign the welcome pads so we can record your attendance. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, in a world filled with trouble. Let us encourage one another to look to the one who has overcome the world. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please rise and greet old friends and make a new one today. Let's pray together and also welcome to all those who are worshiping with us online today. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the way that you reveal yourself to us. We thank you for the wonders of, of your creation that point to your greatness and your power and your glory. And Father, we thank you for the greatest display of your glory and your grace, which has come to us through Jesus. We thank you for him and for all that he has done for us. We pray this morning that our hearts would be open, that our ears would be attentive, that we would be quick to hear what you have to say to us through your word. Father, we thank you for this time, and we ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, on, early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb and made the great discovery. 
He is not here. He is risen. And then Jesus appeared to first to Mary Magdalene. And then that evening, he appeared to Peter and all the disciples as they were gathered in the upper room. And then he appeared to Thomas. And that's where we find ourselves today. We are in John chapter 20, verses 24 to 31. And we will read about Thomas. Let's now stand together once again, if you would, please. We stand out of respect for God who speaks to us through his word. This is God's word. Now Thomas, one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of his nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do you disbelieve? But believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is God's word. Please be seated. When was the last time that you said, I have to see it to believe it? I suspect that's something that we've all said quite a bit. Uh, your, your, your teenager promises that tomorrow morning they are going to do all the chores that they didn't do today. What do you say to that? I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, when uh, your, uh, your husband says to you, this weekend, which happens to be the Sweet 16 weekend, this weekend I'm finally going to clean out the garage. It's going to happen this time. What do you say to that? Well, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Uh, when your wife says to you, she wakes up one morning and says, you know, I've been thinking about it, and I think I'm, I'm going to, you know that golf, that, that guy's golf trip you've been talking about? I think you should do that. <laughs> How do you respond to that, guys? I'll believe it when I see it, right? We say that all the time, don't we? I, I, whenever I go on Amazon before I buy something, I always read all of the reviews. Half of those are probably not, they're probably, you know, they're artificial intelligence, who knows? But I, still, I want to read the reviews because I want to know, does this really work? And I, wanna, I want some sort of outside evidence and proof that this might actually work in the way that it's supposed to. When you go on a vacation, what do you do? You, you look up on the internet, you look at all the pictures. You, know, you go in TripAdvisor or wherever you go and you, and you read all the reviews and you look at all the pictures. And, and why do we do all of these things? Because all of us have been burned. We've all been on the vacation where we get to the, we get to the rental and it's, it's not as big as it looked in the pictures. And you know, it's not in the place where we thought it was. You know, it's, it's, there's, we're always surprised by things. And so our experience has taught us to be skeptical and to, to do all of the, the research before we can actually buy into something. Well, this morning we meet somebody who's kind of a kindred spirit, isn't he? Thomas, who's famously known as doubting Thomas, which really is not fair, is it? Because really, when you think about it, Thomas was not just a great doubter. He was really a great believer. You know, Thomas came to the point of, of belief, which I think gives hope to all of us, because if you're one of these people that you can relate to Thomas, perhaps you'll be encouraged and maybe even challenged by him that really, ultimately, he's not known for his doubt. He's really known for his belief and what happened in him. And so this morning, we're going to walk through this a bit together. What can we learn from Thomas, the doubter? And, and what did we learn from how the Lord responded to Thomas as the doubter? You know, th those are the two things I'd like for us to explore. Uh, what can we learn from Thomas? And then what do we learn about the Lord, really, in the way that he interacts with Thomas? And so let's start with, with doubting Thomas. In verse 24, we read that now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. And so the, the, the context is that this is, this is a week later, a week after Resurrection Sunday, and, um, and when, G when Jesus does appear to him. But right here, it's, it's, it's evident that Thomas, for whatever reason, didn't show up on that first Sunday night. Uh, he, he's, he's not there. He's AWOL, which is interesting because you, you see that many other people 
uh, did see t- Jesus. Mary, Mary saw Jesus at the tomb. Peter and the other disciples were gathered in the room, and you remember the scene, the doors were locked, and Jesus came and appeared to them, and it was astonishing. But where was Thomas? You know, why didn't he go on the first night? He was one of the 12. Where was he? And so there's some speculation amongst, especially the, all the various commentators, you know, where, where was Thomas? Uh, you know, Thomas was one step away from Judas, you know, would be kind of the rumor that might have been flying around about Thomas, um, that maybe he was, he was obstinate and, and hard, you know, hard-hearted, uh, j- just like Judas. Well, it's interesting when you start to look at, at the other mentions of, John, of, of Thomas in John's gospel, he's mentioned about four different times. Earlier in John chapter 11, when, Jesus, when Lazarus was, was raised from the dead, uh, Jesus came and, and he raised him. And in that context, Thomas was the, the one uh, who, when, when Jesus was invited to, co- to go back, to, to go and visit Lazarus and to raise him from the dead, Thomas was very quick to say, let us come too. We want to go and, and, and die also. He seemed to have this understanding that maybe they were all going to die, but he was eager to go. There was, a, there was a real eagerness on his part, and so perhaps like Peter, who would eventually deny Jesus, Thomas was somebody who at least he had good intentions, and he was eager. He was zealous, and so you see that from him in John chapter 11. In John chapter 14, we, we see him again in the context of the upper room discourse, and in that context, Jesus is talking about how he's going away to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And in that context, Thomas uh, asks a very honest question and says, you know, Lord, we don't know where you are going. Basically, Thomas is concerned about the logistics. You know, how, how are we going to come and, and join you in this place? And so you see Thomas kind of, kind of working this out. He's not doubting the fact that Jesus is going to do this, but rather he's struggling with the how. How are we going to join you in this place? And so you see a real sincerity here in Thomas and a desire to be with Jesus. It's interesting that one of the great artists, Leonardo da Vinci, in his painting of The Last Supper, the disciple who's sitting right next to Jesus, real close to him, is Thomas. That Thomas was, was one who uh, was actually a very genuine, a very genuine disciple uh, who, who uh, was, was very engaged with Jesus. And so where was he on the first Sunday night? You know, that's kind of the mystery. Why wasn't he there? And we really don't know. John doesn't tell us. And so, you know, maybe he was the pessimistic type. Maybe he was in hiding somewhere. Maybe he was depressed. Um, maybe he had honest questions, and he, he genuinely was struggling with, with, with doubts. And, and so w- whatever the situation might have been, in verse 25, he finally speaks and he says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. And so he's very resolute about this, isn't he? Um, I, I won't believe unless I see these things. You know, have you ever felt like this? Have you, you know, maybe with respect to your faith, have you, maybe you felt like Thomas in the sense that you have followed Jesus, you've trusted in him, and things haven't quite worked out the way that you thought they would. Certainly that's where Thomas was and all the disciples, where they were wondering what was going to happen next. Their faith was being tested. And maybe you know what that's like. Maybe you know what it's like to follow God, to trust God, to go somewhere and to do something, and, and you get there and you're like, what's going on? You know, this, this wasn't part of the plan. I didn't sign up for this. You get the impression that maybe that's what Thomas was struggling with. Maybe he was at the place where he started to think that maybe God didn't really... Maybe God wasn't as powerful as he thought he was. You know, maybe, maybe God really isn't able to handle the situation. Have you ever been in that kind of a place? Or maybe, he, maybe he's thinking, you know, maybe God doesn't really care about me like I thought he did. Maybe this is punishment. Maybe, I have gone, maybe I've just gone too far this time, and I've, you know, I've, I've done one too many things that I shouldn't have done, and God is finished with me. You know, very often, that's where I find that doubt is a problem in my own life. It's not that I doubt who God is or, 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 or the fact that he's able to do whatever he wants to do, but rather, I struggle with doubting that he will do, that, that, that I struggle with doubting in his goodness, and will he keep his promises? That's often where I find my struggles, and maybe that's where Thomas was too. Maybe he was, this was more of an emotional than an intellectual struggle. Perhaps that was the case. Whatever it might be, he was, he was resolute, wasn't he? That, that he, he, wanted to see, he wanted the proof. You know, all of us have struggled with this. It's interesting, Spurgeon, the great preacher, said this. I think when, when a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. 
It is quite time for us to begin to say, oh, poor soul, I'm afraid you're not on the road at all. For if you were, you would see so many things in yourself and so much glory in Christ, more than you deserve, that you would be so much more ashamed of yourself even to say, this is all too good to be true. You know, that, that has a, tr- a ring of truth, doesn't it? That really the person who's an, a, a genuine believer is, is somebody who at times does struggle with, with, with doubting, and, and, and we all have our doubts. We all have our moments where, where we struggle with this. And so is it a sin to doubt? It is, yes. But is it the unforgivable sin? No, it's not. And so we see that, that how Jesus here responds to the person who's struggling with doubt. And watch what happens. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, if you've been reading the text and paying attention, you, will very, you would have very quickly noticed that this is a replay. The week, a week earlier, the, basically the exact same thing happened, that they all gathered in the upper room, the doors were locked because they were afraid, and then Jesus appeared, and it was amazing and wonderful, and so here the same thing happens again, except this time Thomas is there. He's, he's with them. And so then, verse 27 Jesus says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Now, some people read this as being like an angry rebuke, (laughs) as if Jesus is saying to Thomas, you know, all the other guys believed. Why don't you believe? Here, okay, here, you know, sticks his hands in his face. See, you know, this, look at the, look at the holes in my hands, Uh, as if that's some sort of a rebuke that, that he's, he's giving to to Thomas, but that, that's, I think it's just the opposite. I think Jesus is coming to him with great gentleness and saying, Thomas, you have, you have questions and you need to see the, the nail-scarred hands and you need to see the holes. Well, here I am. You know, here, come, come and see for yourself. And so what we see here is, is Jesus treating his doubting disciple with truth and with grace. Uh, at the very same time, he's, he, he's absolutely presenting himself to him and, and correcting him and showing, not maybe correcting him, but proving to him uh, that, that he is who he says he is. And, and he says to him, stop doubting and believe. He's, in, he's, he's encouraging him. He's, he's reminding him, you know, we spent three years together. You saw all of the signs and wonders. You, know, you saw the water turn into wine. You saw the, the, the 5,000 fed on the hillside. You saw the, you saw the storm stilled in the boat. You saw all of these things. Remember those things. And so he's, he's, he's helping him to remember what is true and rebuking him. And at the same time, he's showing him great grace and kindness and generosity. You you wanted to see my hands? Well, here they are. See for yourself. And so, uh, you know, Jesus honors people with honest doubts. That's what we see consistently in Scripture, that he goes, he's patient with Nicodemus. The teacher of Israel who comes and has all these questions, Jesus is very patient and and gracious with him. The woman at the well, John chapter 3, who's who's the outcast in the middle of the day at the well, that Jesus goes to her and takes the initiative and shows grace to her. He, he, he honors people who genuinely are, are seeking, genuinely want to know him. You know, he, he, knows, he knows our faults and our failures, and he's willing to come and, and meet us where we are, isn't he? Um, and so he says to him uh, to stop, stop being an unbeliever, Thomas, but be a believer. How, how did Thomas respond to this? Verse 28, my Lord and my God. This, this is one of the, this, this might be one of the, the biggest, most profound professions of faith in, in the New Testament. But my, my Lord and my God, he goes from the place where, well, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna believe this unless I see the proof to, I believe it. You know, he's all in at this point, my Lord and my God. And there's, there's a, there's a, there are two, two things about this, this profession that are, that are outstanding. The first one is there's an objectivity to it. He, he refers to Jesus as God my Lord and my God. He recognizes who Jesus is in this moment and affirms it, that Jesus, in fact, is God in the flesh. This is one of the only places in the New Testament where you see this kind of clarity come out of somebody's mouth, and, and he affirms that. You also see there's, there's, there's an experiential element to this as well. It's objective. He is the Lord, but then there's also, he, he's my Lord. He's my God. There's a personal commitment here that's built into this. He is submitting himself to the, to the Lord God Almighty, my Lord, my God. And so you see in, in, in this 
this transformation of self, don't you? Uh, this, this first, he's recognizing that he is God, and then, it, then he's submitting to that. And so uh, you see this response. You know, how, how should we respond then to, to all of this? How should we respond to Jesus who comes and, and treats Thomas in, in this way? Well, you know, our, uh, and treats us in this way too. Well, the, the thought that comes to mind on this Easter morning is that our hearts ought to be filled with gratitude and with joy, with thanksgiving for all that he's done. And there are three specific things from this passage that I think, that I think make that a little more focused uh, in terms of gratitude. Number one, we should thank Thomas for asking the hard question, shouldn't we? That really, Tom, we should give Thomas credit where credit is due. That at least he was willing to come and ask the question that maybe they were all asking and that we'd all wanna ask, which is, is this really true? Jesus, are you really who you say you are? Can, can, you, can you show us the proof that, that this is real? And, and what's interesting is that um, most commentators agree that he didn't actually, he didn't actually do it. <laughs> he didn't actually put his finger in, his, in, the, in, the hole, in the holes in his hand. Rather, he just fell to his knees. When Jesus, when Jesus spoke to him, that was all he needed. He saw and he received and he believed and he confessed, you know, my Lord and my God. What's interesting then is how Jesus responded to him and to that moment. In verse 29, Jesus said, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen me and have yet believed. And so here Jesus is anticipating you know, the future generations of people who are coming. And so who's he, who's he referring to here? He's referring to us, isn't he? The, we're the ones who are hearing this testimony coming through the apostles, through Thomas. Frederick Dale Bruner, one of the commentators, calls this the last great beatitude. Blessed are those who, who don't see but believe. Of course, and that's a play off of the Sermon on the Mount, isn't it? In the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who, who are, are the last. Um, but, but here, it's blessed are those who believe without having to see my hands and my feet. Um, and of course, he, he's referring to, to all of us. And so, we, our hearts should be filled with gratitude for Thomas, for leading the way, and, 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 and for showing us uh, the way to Jesus. Secondly, we should be filled with thanks to the apostles, to all of the apostles for speaking to us through the Bible and giving us the ability to listen to them. And this is, this is how God reveals himself to us. And Tim Keller makes the observation that uh, the, the apostles' main focus was was not on his teaching, Jesus' teaching, as much as it was on affirming his identity and affirming who he was. And think about that for a second. In the first century, would, would Jesus' teaching have been, uh, have been the thing that was life-changing? You know, in, in our context, people love his teaching on, on peace and generosity and faithfulness and you know, all the things that Jesus talked about. You know, love your neighbor, feed the hungry, you know, all of these things, help the poor. And yet, um, for, for their audience, good, good news for them was deliverance. Good news for them was forgiveness and assurance. Good news for them was that we have, we have somebody who has, has won the victory over sin and death. And that's good news for us too, isn't it? And so we should thank the, we should thank the apostles for speaking to us and for, for giving us this truth in a way that, that we can hear it and receive it, that Jesus has been, Jesus is risen you know, Thomas affirms that for us, this truth on, on Easter Sunday, that Jesus is the one who's raised from the dead. And finally, we should thank Jesus for being patient with the doubter, with all of us, for, 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 the, for his great patience. Um, you know, Thomas isn't the only disciple who's ever doubted. Jesus has shown great patience to us, uh, with all of us who are slow to believe at times. You know, listen again to his invitation to Peter. Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it uh, in my side. You know, how did Jesus know to come to Thomas like this? And, and the answer is because he was listening to Thomas. You know, he knew exactly what Thomas needed before Thomas even knew what he needed. He, Jesus was willing to condescend and, and to, to come to him and, and reveal himself to him in a way that, that helped him. If you watch the Super Bowl, do you remember the ads that were, came on at the Super Bowl that were, he, he gets us? 
Remember those ads? And it caused a little bit of a stir. Everybody, you know, everybody out there was wondering, you know, what's, what's going on here? But I think it costs like $20 million to put these ads on, on, on halftime. And, and there was a lot of speculation about, about you know, what, what are their motives? Why are they doing this? And it was interesting. So I went and read about, you know, this, the people that were behind the He Gets Us ads. And it was really very simple. That, that's it. I mean, they were just simply trying to communicate that Jesus is, Jesus is the one who gets, who gets us. Jesus is the one who understands. Jesus is the one who has left the glories of heaven to come and dwell in our midst to make himself known to us. He, he understands. He's the one who created us and he knows us. He knows you intimately and, and perfectly. And so he's the one who comes to you. And, and, and so that, that really is the, the message of, of, uh, of those ads, isn't it? Uh, he, he, he understands. And, and this is... Uh, this is, demonstrates for us his patience and his love with us, that, that he comes to us and, and reveals himself to us in such a way that, that, um, that melts us. You know, there's really only, only one thing that will break our hard-heartedness, and it's seeing God's willingness to sacrifice himself for us and to give himself up for us. You know, do you really believe that, that God would, would do uh, would give you his, you know, all of his blessings and his favor and his forgiveness. And, and the evidence, the proof that he's serious about that is Jesus coming and dying and, and rising again from the dead and making us new. That's what melts our hearts, is seeing what he has done for us. That's what draws us to him and, and makes us grateful for, for all that he's done. And so on this Easter Sunday, may our hearts be filled with gratitude as we remember all that Jesus has done for us, as we reflect on Thomas, on his journey from, from the darkness of doubt and despair to the light of his glory, of this profession, my Lord and my God, may, may, that, be, may that be our proclamation today. May, may we say with the same amount of enthusiasm, my Lord and my God, Jesus is the one who has come for us because of his great love. May we embrace that today and make that our profession of faith. Let's pray and ask him to do that in each one of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the, the way that you revealed yourself to Thomas and for how you've revealed yourself to us through his story and through the story of all of the apostles. Father, we thank you for this, this amazing truth that, that you are the, the God who left the glories of heaven to come and dwell in our midst, to take upon yourself flesh and blood and to be willing to, to give yourself for us and to be the, the ultimate sacrifice for our sin so that we might be forgiven. Father, we thank you and we praise you for, for your love and for uh, the, the great price that you paid for our redemption. May our hearts today be filled with gratitude for all that you have done. May we say with Thomas, my Lord and my God, may we profess this and from the top of our, from, with, a, with all of our strength, uh, may we proclaim your greatness and your glory and all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you and praise you with all that we have. Amen. Church, please rise and receive the gospel charge. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Amen. As we come to the table this morning, may our hearts be filled with gratitude and joy for what Jesus has done for us. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and having given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the, si the disciples, saying, This is my body, which has been given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. 
You can imagine on that, that first Sunday when the disciples met to take the supper together, you can imagine that all of the memories were, were fresh to them of time with Jesus, especially that memory of that first supper and, and, and Jesus' words to them that this is his body given for you. Eat and, and, and do this in remembrance of me. He then took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is shed for you. For as often as you drink from this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And so we proclaim the Lord's death recognizing that it's his death on our behalf that gives us life. That in him we experience newness of life because of his work on our behalf, of paying the penalty for our sin and satisfying the Father's wrath. And so as we come to the table this morning, may our hearts be filled with gratitude for what Jesus has done for us. As we eat the bread and as we drink from the cup, may the reality of those elements, just as the bread is real and the, and the juice, you can taste it, may those point to the reality of the gospel, that Jesus is the one who lived and died for you, that you might be forgiven and might be, have, be in relationship with him. Now, if you're here today and if you have never come to that place where you have trusted in Christ, well, then I, I invite you to believe. I encourage you to, to, to come to Jesus and make that profession, my Lord and my God, and, and believe and trust in him for the forgiveness of your sin. And yet I would also ask you to wait to take the communion supper until you can do so with faith, as that's really the point of the supper, is that we would come by faith and commune with Jesus, recognizing what he has done for us and trusting fully and finally in him. Let us then lift up our hearts to the Lord. Lift up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to our Lord God. It is right to give him thanks and, and let us pray. O Lord and Heavenly Father, when we celebrate and observe this memorial your Son has commended to us, we remember his suffering and death his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, and we await his coming again with power and great glory. God of mercy, hear our prayer, and by your word and Holy Spirit, bless and sanctify these gifts of bread and wine. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your Holy Spirit. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, Lord Jesus, until you come again. This morning, you will be served the elements, and so please remain in your seats. Uh, we'll also hold the elements and take them together as a sign of our unity in Christ. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving.
Jesus has come to give food to the hungry. By eating this, we trust in his provision that he is the one who feeds us. Take and eat and believe upon him. Jesus then took the cup and said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is shed for you. On Good Friday, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he said, it is finished, and he breathed his last breath. It is finished. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As you drink, drink and believe upon him. Father, we thank you for the gift of grace that you have given to us through Jesus. Thank you for the life that he gives Thank you for the the joy and the peace and the hope and everything that flows out of that. Father, today may our hearts be filled with joy and gratitude for all that you have done. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you would please pass the cup to the inside aisle to be picked up.
As we sing this final hymn, it's an opportunity for us to express our joy and our gratitude to him and to respond to his generosity to us. Let's stand together and sing to him. It's wonderful to be here with all of you this morning. We got a full house, and it's great that we could all fit uh, in this. So thank you, especially to the deacons, for expanding our seating arrangements. If you're here for the first time, uh, we are thrilled that you are with us. We'd love to meet you afterwards. Um, and for those of you who have been coming a little bit or coming for quite some time, we do have a intro to CPC class at the end of the month, April 28th and May 5th. We're going to be doing that in the church lobby. So that is required for membership. If that is of interest to you, please let me know. We also have uh, two fellowship events coming up in the life of our church. We have a men's fellowship event on April 20th. It's on a Saturday from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock. Uh, there may be some uh, firearms involved. There will definitely be barbecue involved. Uh, email is James Shell there at men at CPC. And we also have a women's fellowship a tea party not the boston tea party but the georgetown tea party here may 4th saturday at three o'clock p.m uh, there will be tea delicate treats and the frilliest of dresses are encouraged so uh, suzanne and then alexia st john are the contacts for that and finally we have a parenting conference coming up on friday at redeemer presbyterian church in austin we are a presbyterian church of america church so it's a conservative evangelical denomination of about 500,000 people and about 1,600 churches. So this is one of our sister churches. A few of their pastors, I think, will be preaching here in the coming months. Uh, please look at that if that is of interest to you, especially for those of us who still have children in the home. Again, thank you so much, and we look forward to conversing with you afterwards. And thank you again for being here this morning, especially thank you to all of those who came earlier for breakfast. Thank you to all of the cooks. It was delicious. And for those who organized it, Russ and Debbie Newcomb, thank you to the Newcombs for their hard work on all of that. And thank you to all of you for being here today. Let's now stand together as we receive the Lord's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him, above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. He is risen.